Welcome back, everybody. And so our next instructor is Dr. David Lewis. And David, are you, there you are. Hi, can and you hear me? So we're gonna kind of pick up where we've, where we kind of been leaving off here. And David's gonna talk about feeding and you know, the care of your bees and, you know, when to add pollen patties and when to make, when to do fondant. Um, he does a lot of essential oils. And so he's, he's got a wealth of information on that. And then some fundamental equipment. And then questions are always, always welcome. You can put them in the chat box or you can unmute yourself, um, raise your hand, unmute yourself and ask a question is always welcome. And so David um, started beekeeping back in 2014. And <laughs> he's been at the bee college, every bee college I've hosted. He's, he's now starting to teach at the bee colleges. He does evening programs to my Tuesday evening beekeeping programs. He's um, been a speaker and instructor there. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to you, David, and it's your show now. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Uh, I certainly hope that next year we'll, our Bee College will be face-to-face, -face, but if it's not, I'm gonna have to ask to go earlier because trying to follow Dr. Nairati and then Michael Jordan, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> Michael was actually the instructor at the beginning beekeeping track back in the first bee college I went to in 2014. And so he is somewhat responsible for my having taken up beekeeping and probably responsible for an awful lot of dead bees that I've had in the last six years as well. Uh, but I know there are a lot of folks here in uh, Wyoming and Nebraska and Colorado who have taken up beekeeping because they heard Carolina or Michael speak and their enthusiasm is, is infectious. Um, I've got two rather different topics. One is about feeding your bees. Uh, the other is on some tools and accessories that may be handy. Um, we'll start with talking about feeding bees. About three or four years ago, I went to a lecture by a university professor about honeybee nutrition. And I discovered that there's a whole lot about honeybee nutrition that I don't know. Uh, he started talking very rapidly, he started flashing slides on the screen. Uh, he had uh, amino acid profiles of many pollens and some pollen substitutes with the uh, percentages of about 20 different amino acids that were present in those pollens. Uh, he had uh, experiments in which bees had been raised on restricted diets that were lacking in one nutrient or another and how that affected their development and their fertility. And the information just came pouring out uh, slide after slide. I think I probably wasn't the only person in the audience whose eyes were a little glazed when uh, we got to the end of the hour, but I raised my hand and I asked, uh, given your research, what do you recommend as the, the best supplement if we're going to supplement um, nectar and pollen for our bees? And the professor said, gosh, I don't know. Maybe one of those commercial bee feeds, I guess. Uh, so, so that was a little disappointing. Uh, I, I, I enjoy hearing about honeybee research, but especially if it leads to some sort of practical information that I can use to become a better beekeeper and to keep my bees alive. Um, so I hope that today's talk will be fairly practical. I'm gonna talk about um, why we feed the bees, uh, when we feed the bees, what we feed the bees, and how we feed the bees. And uh, I hope you'll get some information here that will at least offer you some options and choices, uh, particularly if you're starting off uh, in beekeeping this year, or even if you've got an overwintered hive and you're going to need to be looking into that hive and perhaps uh, feeding them fairly soon. So let me uh, see if I can get my PowerPoint up here. If I share screen, are you able to see, are you able to see that? You're getting there, okay. Carolina, can Keep you see going. that? Yeah. Okay, so why do I have to feed my bees? Uh, people sometimes say the bees should fend for themselves. There's plenty of flowers around. They somehow don't say that about their dogs or cats or horses or their goldfish 
we assume that we're going to need to feed our pets uh, in that way, but some people are, are still puzzled as to why they might need to feed the bees. If you live in a, a very um, favorable environment where there are lots of blooming flowers at all of the seasons of the beekeeping year, uh, you may not have to feed your bees or may not have to feed them very much, but most of us are not that lucky. Uh, in some places, you might have an excellent bloom. Perhaps there's an acre or two of alfalfa or clover nearby, and you'll have an excellent source of nectar and pollen for mm, two or three weeks of the year, but not necessarily throughout the whole beekeeping season. Uh, sometimes, uh, although the bees will go out, uh, I think uh, Joe compared to told us 55,000 acres within a two mile radius are the usual foraging range for a honeybee colony. So that's a lot of territory, but sometimes the, the things that are in bloom are simply uh, not accessible to your bees. Uh, you might live next to an orchard and the orchard comes into bloom, but in Wyoming in the spring, we might then have a frost and the bees, it's too cold for the bees to fly, so they can't really take advantage of uh, the, the blooms that are present early in the year. And sometimes if you are relying on a neighbor who might have a field with uh, sanfoin or uh, clover or alfalfa, uh, those are typically harvested just prior to bloom when the nutrition content of those crops is highest. I know our president was looking across her uh, road and there was a nice field of alfalfa and she was kind of rubbing her hands and thinking this year we're gonna have a great load of alfalfa honey. And the mower came out just prior to that field going into bloom. So um, we can't always rely on the floral resources in, in our neighborhood. And that's why we may need to supplement feeding in the hive. The goals of feeding are a little different, different times of year. In the spring, uh, the queen is ramping up for laying of eggs, and we would like to support that. We'd like to encourage the increase in the colony population, uh, support the brood rearing, and brood require protein as well as carbohydrate uh, to be able to develop fully. In the summertime, if we're feeding at all, we're feeding to support the production of honey. And in the fall, the bees are preparing to lay up stores for the winter, so we're trying to support uh, storage of honey and bee bread. Bee bread is the uh, product of pollen that the bees chew up and digest and store for later use um, so that they will have ample stores over the winter. Uh, during the winter, it's uh, hard to get into the hives, uh, but our goal is to have enough uh, resources within the hive so that that overwintering colony will be able to survive some pretty harsh conditions, low temperatures, and no opportunity to forage for weeks to months during, during the winter. So that's why, why we're feeding the bees. So David, I'm, yes. gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you briefly. If you, if you look at your PowerPoint program, mm -hmm. at the very bottom, you'll see some icons and if okay. you click the one that's got the full screen. Okay, let's see here. So go down, go over. One more. That one? One more. One more. Oh. Oh, let's see. Okay. Oh. Is that, that doesn't look quite ideal. Is that good enough? Hit escape. Um, Go ahead, Sarah. If you hit escape, it should make it back to the screen you were on before. Okay. Well, we don't want all of those all up, up at once. Okay. Let's try this. And then the one at the far right. Hmm. Okay. It should be that one. Is this the one, one here? That's, yeah. And nothing much is happening there. The one that looks like you can pull it down, it looks like a screen that you pull down, is that tiny little button. That one that said slide. Right here? Over to the left some more. Left right here? That one. Okay. Oh, it won't do it because you have that open, so you have to close that box first. Okay. That one. Okay. Is that what we want? Yep. 
It's showing right. your next slide, but that's okay. Okay, well, let's go on here. So what are we gonna feed the bees? Well, as I said, honeybee nutrition can be made very, very complicated if you get into individual amino acids and individual nutrients, but basically it's pretty simple. The bees collect nectar and pollen, the nectar for the carbohydrate, the pollen for protein, and there is a little bit of lipid in uh, the uh, pollen as well, which supplies the, the need of the honeybees for fat. So really what we need to do is find a substitute for nectar or honey and find a substitute for pollen if we can't supply the nectar or honey and the pollen directly. Now, uh, it's clear that for carbohydrate, honey is probably the ideal food for honeybees and better than anything we can concoct uh, to take its place. And if you have a source of honey that is uh, trustworthy and dependable, you certainly can use honey to feed your bees. The problem is that commercial honey is uh, usually blended from multiple, multiple sources. Many beekeepers contribute uh, to what goes into the jar that's sold on the supermarket shelf. And for that reason, we're somewhat suspicious of what might be in that honey. Could it contain disease organisms and particularly spores, which are very uh, long-lived and robust and will survive most of the processing of honey, uh, spores from uh, American fowl brood would be one thing that we'd worry about. Uh, it might have viruses in it. Uh, it could be contaminated with pesticides or herbicides. And uh, of lately, there is some concern that what's in that jar wasn't made by honeybees in the first place, that it's been adulterated with other kinds of uh, sugars, that it's been processed, uh, treated with resins to remove pesticides that were present in the honey when it was harvested, and so on and so on. Um, nonetheless, if you know of a source of honey, or if you have uh, frames of capped honey that you have saved from previous seasons, that's a great food for bees but most of us may not have access to a, a trustworthy source of clean honey um, that we can use in the hives. So instead we feed the bees sugar syrup. And that sounds funny to a lot of folks because you yourself and you probably wouldn't let your kids drink uh, plain granulated sugar in water. It doesn't sound very nutritious, but it actually is about the closest we can come to uh, natural nectar. And we're using white sugar. It doesn't matter whether it's from sugar cane or from beets, uh, either is fine, but not brown sugar or raw sugar or molasses. Uh, those have substances in them that are indigestible to the bees. High fructose corn syrup uh, is probably okay, although there are some people who dislike uh, high fructose corn syrup on principle and would prefer to use uh, plain white sugar. The usual rule of thumb, and it is just a rule of thumb, is that in the spring, we make a relatively thin syrup, which is about one to one sugar to water. And it doesn't matter whether you do that by weight, a pound to a pound, or by volume, a pint to a pint, because as it happens, water and sugar are fairly similar in, in their weight, in their density. So you can do it whichever way is easier uh, for you. In the fall, we're trying to help the bees set, put up stores for the winter. And it is helpful to them if they don't have to concentrate the uh, sugar uh, solution. Uh, if it's thicker than normal nectar, that's fine because it makes it a little easier for them to process that and store it as honey for the winter. So we use a two to one solution of sugar, two sugar to one water in the fall. Now be aware that if you mix a pint of water and a pound of sugar, you don't necessarily get a quart of syrup. The sugar molecules intersperse into the water and you will end up with probably about uh, uh, three cups, a pint and a half of syrup uh, once the sugar is, is dissolved. So if you're trying to achieve an ending volume of syrup, you have to do some calculation to figure out just how much you're gonna get. Um, the uh, one to one and two to one are really just rules of thumb. And if you look at some of the beekeeping guides, you'll see that very often uh, the solutions are less than the one to one or two to one that is the general recommendation. 
So uh, Story's Guide to Beekeeping, there are three formulas, one for spring, one for summer, one for fall. None of those is even as high as one to one. A one to one sol solution would be eight pounds of sugar in eight pounds of water. That's a gallon of water. And even his fall solution is less than one to one, far, far be it from two to one. Uh, University of Minnesota recommends four pounds of sugar in a gallon of water. That's a one half to one ratio. That's their spring solution. And their fall solution is one to one, not actually two to one. If you try to dissolve 16 pounds of sugar into one gallon of water, which is a true two to one uh, solution uh, in Wyoming, when the temperature outside gets below about 50 or so, you're likely to see the precipitation of some white sugar into the bottom of your feeder, which is not a necessarily a problem, but it shows that that solution is super saturated. Um, and so, it, Take these with a little bit, take it with a grain of salt, but uh, we're, this is not an exact science. Like any sort of recipe, you have some opportunities to do some variations and it'll still work. Uh, here's a syrup recipe that's almost one-to-one, -one, two quarts of water plus one cup more and five pounds of sugar, and it makes about three quarts of syrup. Or for two-to-one, uh, this was in kilograms, two kilograms of sugar in one liter of water. That's about four and a half pounds of sugar in a quart of water. And it makes about two quarts of two to one syrup. Or you can just measure them by volume. I have to say what I do is simply uh, fill the jar about halfway with sugar and then add some water, stir it up till it dissolves, add a little more water to top it off and I'm done. I don't measure uh, the solutions exactly. Do you need to boil your syrup? Well, the simple answer is no. You can mix your syrup right in the sink using warm tap water and that's fine. If uh, there are some reasons why people like to boil the syrup, one of them is that it's easier to dissolve the sugar, uh, particularly if you're in the fall trying to, to make a denser sugar solution. It can also kill microorganisms that are in sugar or in your water. Now I run my, uh, I use glass jar feeders and I run them through the dishwasher. So I'm pretty sure that the jars don't uh, have any microorganisms on them. But even so, after a couple of weeks, the syrup may start to develop a kind of a dark cobwebby uh, appearance of a little fungus growing in the sugar solution. Uh, and I'm sure that came from the sugar itself. It wasn't in the jar and I'm pretty sure it wasn't in the water. I don't think it does any harm, uh, but if I boiled uh, my uh, syrup, I might be able to avoid having that little filmy stuff appear after the uh, solution has been in the jar for a couple of weeks. And the other reason for, for heating syrup is something called uh, inverted sugar, inver sugar inversion. Um, the sucrose, which is what's in uh, cane sugar, table sugar, is a disaccharide, which means that it has two carbon rings uh, which are hooked together. If you heat that with a little bit of acid, you can break those two rings apart. And the sucrose breaks down into glucose and fructose, which are monosaccharides and have just a single carbon ring. And it's actually glucose and fructose, which are the more common sugars found in nectar. So some people believe that uh, cooking, cooking your uh, sucrose syrup with a little bit of acid in it uh, will create a syrup that's closer uh, to natural nectar. Um, bakers have been doing sugar inversion for quite a while because breaking down the disaccharide molecule into two monosaccharides makes the product taste sweeter. And it also holds more water into the cookies or cakes so that they have a longer shelf life. So bakers have been uh, cooking their sugar with a little acid uh, for quite a long time as a part of uh, producing cookies and cakes. Disadvantages are you've got a pot full of boiling syrup on your stove and that's no fun. And if you let that sugar scorch and caramelize so that it turns brown or black, it elaborates a chemical, hydroxyfurfural, which the bees cannot digest. So if you are heating your syrup, keep a close eye on it and make sure that uh, you don't scorch it or, or caramelize the sugar in the syrup. Do you need to add flavoring to your syrup? No, you don't have to. The bees will accept syrup that is simply sugar and water, but many people believe that uh, the, sugar, the syrup is more palatable to the bees if it has a little bit of herbal flavoring in it. 
Uh, you can flavor it with essential oils like lemongrass or spearmint or peppermint, or you can flavor it by putting plants or herbs into the syrup, uh, the warm syrup, and letting it steep so that the syrup becomes a little bit of an herbal tea. And there are many possible flavorings of mint family, and which includes thyme, sage, a lemon balm, alfalfa, chamomile, other flowers, alfalfa, all of those things can be used to flavor your syrup. And there is some evidence that the bees find that a little more palatable than plain sugar and water. You don't have to, but you may. If you can smell the herbs, the bees can definitely smell them. So a little bit goes a long way. Don't make uh, the uh, tea stronger than you would drink yourself and probably a little more delicate than, uh, than you would uh, think think will be fine. The bees will be able to detect those uh, aromatic compounds in the syrup. And do take the herbs out before you put them into your, your feeder. There is a commercial uh, supplement called Honey Bee Healthy that has lemongrass and spearmint essential oils. And there is some research that shows that the bees take syrup more readily when it has the Honey Bee Healthy in it than uh, plain syrup. And if you want to make your own Honey Bee Healthy, here's a recipe to do that. It essentially uses spearmint and lemongrass essential oil in a one-to-one -one syrup. And uh, in this recipe, a little bit of lecithin as an emulsifier. And you pre-soak the uh, lecithin, dissolve the sugar, uh, heat it, and uh, remove it from the heat before adding the essential oils. Uh, and then whip it in the blender so that it becomes a little uh, airy, a little foamy. Uh, and you can store it in the refrigerator and add it to your syrup as you make your plain, plain syrup blade. Or you can buy the Honey Bee Healthy at the bee supply store uh, with the same effect. You need to add vitamins to your syrup. Um, well, uh, I don't know that there's a whole lot of science that says that vitamins in syrup uh, will materially uh, change the way your colony works, although there is some evidence in favor of vitamin C. You want to add vitamins to the syrup, you can crush a vitamin C tablet and a single tablet and a gallon of syrup should be fine. Crush the tablet uh, up in a mortar and add it, to, uh, add it to your syrup recipe. There are other vitamin preps. Uh, I know that Albert Chuback, uh, who, who Michael mentioned as the inventor of the Eco Bee Box, uh, uses Complete B, which is a combination of vitamin and essential oils. Uh, Apis Aviaries in Colorado has a proprietary vitamin uh, supplement, and there are others. ProHealth, the Nodes of Eat, Optima, you'll see ads for these in the bee magazines. Um, some manufacturers of protein patties as a pollen substitute also add vitamins to those patties, and that may mean you don't have to add them to your syrup if you're using uh, commercial protein patties. you need to add probiotics to the syrup. Probiotics are microorganisms. There is a whole lot of research going on right now about the organisms that live in the uh, honeybee gut. I think uh, uh, Dr. Nairati showed us a picture that showed the, the honeybee gut with the proventriculus and ventriculus and uh, the uh, intestine and rectum. And the fear is that if we uh, subject honeybees to artificial diets for too long, that we may be changing their microbiology within the gut for the worse. So there are companies that are marking feeding supplements that have microorganisms in them that are uh, supposed to be healthful uh, to maintain honeybees uh, gut health. Um, the companies have their own research papers. They'll be happy to show them. I don't know that this is generally accepted in commercial or hobbyist beekeeping yet. Uh, but some of the manufacturers of uh, protein patties are also adding probiotics to the patties, uh, whether that's uh, really useful to the bees or whether it's more of a marketing ploy, I can't say. Uh, but you can purchase uh, probiotics from Strong Microbials. They, ma they market Super DFM. Uh, there's another Hive Alive, which I think is a combination of some uh, essential oils and probiotics. And another... Uh, possible supplement are fungal extracts. A company called Fungi Perfecti has marketed several uh, extracts from different fungi, which they have tested and say confer some uh, immunity to disease to, to honeybees. I don't use probiotics uh, myself, so I can't really tell you from experience whether they work or, or don't work.
you need to acidify your syrup. Uh, sugar syrup is nearly neutral in pH and honey is rather acidic. Um, so some people think that we should add some acid to the syrup uh, to make it closer to, to honey. Um, and that can be lemon juice or citric acid, uh, fruit fresh, vinegar, and the vitamin C is acidic. Uh, some recipes have used cream of tartar, but there is uh, some evidence that the bees don't digest cream of tartar very well. So if I were going to add acid to my syrup, I'd probably avoid that one. I don't know of any formal research that says that there's a benefit to acidifying the syrup, and I don't acidify my own. Um, but if you are trying to invert your sugar into glucose and fructose, you're going to be adding small amounts of acid to your syrup in any event uh, in order to achieve that conversion. Did you add fumigillin to the uh, syrup? And that would be once in the spring and once again in the fall. Uh, fumigillin or fumidil B is a chemical and it was used in the treatment of nosema. Nosema is a parasite that uh, gets into the honeybee gut and can cause dysentery um, and can weaken and even kill a colony. And it used to be, if you read some of the older beekeeping texts, that they would say, regardless of whether you know you have nosema or not, treat your bees in spring and fall with fum uh, fumigillin added to your syrup. That is no longer recommended. Unfortunately, there is a newer nosema organism. The old one was nosema apis. The new one is nosema serenae. And nosema serenae appears to be relatively resistant to fumagillin. Um, and it may be that we have selected for that resistance by using fumagillin indiscriminately and wiping out some of the nosema apis, allowing nosema serenae to take over. Um, all dysentery in honeybees is not caused by nosema. So even though you'll see pictures of fecal staining on the uh, hive entrance, that doesn't prove that your bees have nosema. To prove that, you really have to examine them microscopically and find the nosema spores in the honeybee intestine. And it is suggested that you should do that before you treat with fumadillin. This was a moot point for quite a while because uh, the fumadillin wasn't available. It was no longer being manufactured, but it is back and it is now available. So you have the choice to use it or not, but that is certainly more controversial than it was 20 years ago or so. Kind of a funny story, when they first came out with fumagillin, beekeepers complained that there was something in it that was making their hives swarm. They thought there was a chemical in there that was stimulating swarming. And it turned out that actually, they were just seeing healthy hives that didn't have nosema in them. And those hives uh, increased their population much more rapidly than beekeepers were used to. So they weren't taking swarm prevention measures as early as they should have they were being exposed for the first time to relatively healthy bees. Um, I've also heard from the Minnesota Bee Squad, uh, they asked, uh, how long have you been keeping bees? And if anyone said less than 10 years, they said, you've never seen healthy bees. If you've been beekeeping less than 10 years, all the bees that you know have had nosema or, nosema or uh, varroa or viral diseases, you probably have never actually seen a hive that was in robust good health which is kind of disconcerting, but uh, may in fact be true. So I don't personally use or recommend uh, fumagillin, but there certainly are uh, beekeepers and some beekeeping experts who feel that that's an important part of our armamentarium against these disease causing organisms. So how long are you gonna be feeding syrup to the bees? The general rule of thumb is that if the bees are taking the syrup, it's good to keep providing it to them. And that really doesn't matter what time of, of year it is. We know that we need to feed in times of dearth, and that's the time when there are relatively few floral resources in bloom. In some parts of the country, that's the summertime. There'll be a nice spring bloom when there's moisture in the spring, but then it gets hot in the summer and the nectar dries up. And there are not many things in bloom until rains come again in the fall and uh, uh, their time of dearth uh, ends. In uh, Wyoming, we get quite a lot of our rainfall, although we don't have much rainfall in total, but quite a bit of it falls in the summertime. So our times of dearth might be early spring when the weather is still cold and in fall when fewer flowers are, are in bloom. 
Um, another time to we want to be sure to feed is when we're establishing a new colony, a new package, installing a nuke or splitting. We want to make sure that those bees have optimal conditions because we've uh, made a started a colony with a small number of bees and we want them to reproduce as quickly as possible. Having feeding the bees during the summer or when the honey super is on is controversial. Um, many people feel that it's wrong to sell honey that is made from sugar syrup, that the natural product is made from flower nectar, and that that has flavor and nutrition that would not be present with plain sugar syrup. Therefore, they don't feed the bees uh, sugar syrup when the honey supers are on, which is through the summer and in the early fall. And that seems reasonable to me, uh, but I don't know of any real scientific analysis that says that you can tell honey that is formed from sugar syrup from honey that's derived from nectar. It may indeed be possible. Um, there are ways to tell if someone has added corn syrup or date sugar or sugar from other sources to the honey in order to uh, stretch, stretch out the product with a cheaper amendment. Um, but I don't know that there is real solid evidence that uh, you can tell the difference between honey that comes from uh, made from syrup or honey that's made from, from nectar. That's uh, an interesting question. Uh, should you feed syrup to the bees in the wintertime? Many people avoid doing that. And one of the problems is that the jar might crack, even if it's plastic and certainly glass. Now, two to one sugar syrup has a pretty low freezing point. So uh, it's not going to freeze as quickly as a jar full of water would. But if it does uh, crack and freeze, and then you get a warm morning or a warm day, uh, that uh, syrup will drip down into the hive and can. Uh, cause the bees to become uh, chilled. Um, another question is whether it's wise to add any additional moisture to the hive in the winter. The bees are already generating moisture when they metabolize honey. Uh, the prod byproducts of uh, burning honey for energy are carbon dioxide and water, and quite a bit of water is generated by the bees in the hive. So some people have felt that we should feed dry sugar, a sugar preparation that is not in the form of a syrup, just in order to minimize adding any additional moisture. There is, it is said that bees will not take syrup if the syrup itself is less than 50 degrees. And if you feed a thin syrup in the winter time, it may trick the bees into thinking that nectar is available uh, before it is actually in the spring. And that potentially could stimulate brood rearing in the colony at a time when the colony really cannot support, uh, cannot support additional brood. On the other hand, uh, and we just heard Joe compare to gave a talk in February, uh, he puts uh, syrup in the hive over the winter and does so uh, without problems. So <laughs> it's hard to argue with folks who tell you that it works uh, because of theory that says that it doesn't. And it is also true that if you use a Boardman feeder or a top feeder, those can be refilled without uh, any substantial disturbance to the cluster in the hive. Um, so I think the jury is a little bit out on this, although many of the textbooks will urge you not to feed syrup in the wintertime. Okay, let's talk about the different ways in which you can provide syrup to the hive. Some, most of these are inside the hive, but some are outside the hive. And we'll talk about using just a bucket or a barrel somewhere in your apiary. The entrance feeders, a baggie of syrup feeder inside the hive, a frame feeder that takes the place of one of the frames of the hive, a top tray feeder, which is like a super that fits on top of the hive but holds uh, syrup and water, a pail feeder also fits on top of the hive, or a jar feeder, which is another one, another one of these top feeders that uh, provide the syrup inside the hive. So let's take a look at here's a chicken waterer. Some folks just put, if you have more than one hive, they will just put this out uh, outside the hive, but nearby. You may put pebbles in the bottom or a little coil of nylon rope so that the bees won't drown. So they can still get the syrup, but have something to, to walk on. Um, and you can make a gallon or two of syrup and put it out. You may be feeding all the bees in your neighborhood as well as some unwanted visitors like yellow jackets. Um, but it certainly is a convenient way to uh, provide a bunch of bunch of syrup to uh, multiple hives. I personally prefer to have the uh, feeder inside the hive. 
This is a Boardman feeder. It's called a Boardman because uh, it was invented by a guy named Boardman, not because it goes on the entrance board, but that's what it does. This has a little base on it that slots in the entrance to the hive so that only the bees inside the hive can get under that little area and get to the syrup. And then there's a jar with holes in the lid that allows them to lap the syrup up once they've crawled in underneath. And the notion here is you can see this from the outside of the hive. It's sitting right on the um, landing board. So you know when it needs to be refilled. Um, and for other bees, uh, either robbing bees or other visitors to the hive to get to it, they will have to go in the entrance and then around the corner and then get under the feeder um, so hopefully that will discourage uh, other bees from other hives from, from using the Boardman feeder. Now, unfortunately, it's only a short distance to get to that feeder. And so robbing bees will sometimes persist and try to get in and uh, get to the, the Boardman feeders. If you want to use one of these, you may have to trim down your entrance reducer by the width of that feeder so you can slot it through and still use the entrance reducer uh, on the rest of the entrance of the hive. A baggy feeder is pretty simple. You put some syrup in a Ziploc bag, lay it on right on top of the frames and cut a little slit or a couple of little slits in it. Um, and uh, with a little bit of luck, that won't leak too much out of the slits and the bees will find the syrup and crawl up and get to it. If you are trying to do an emergency feed and you've got no alternative, uh, that's inexpensive and it puts some syrup right where the bees uh, can use it. You might need to have a little spacer box a little frame maybe of uh, three quarter inch or one by two uh, that you can set on top of your uh, brood box there uh, just so that the next, uh, the lid doesn't come down and crush that uh, baggie. And sometimes having a little spacer, an empty uh, medium box or something of that sort uh, will, will help you if you're trying to provide uh, syrup right inside the hive. So, oh, David, a quick question. Yes, sir. And you may even know the story on this one too, but um, the question from Amy is, I have pondered putting food coloring into spring syrup so I can tell if I'm just re-harvesting or if I'm indeed harvesting honey. Ah. So food color into the spring syrup to see where it goes. I uh, have never heard of a beekeeper doing that deliberately, but I have heard of a beekeeper who found that they had red honey in their hive. And they thought that was very peculiar until they saw the bees at the hummingbird feeder. And they had, they had prepared hummingbird syrup and put some red food coloring in it to attract the hummingbirds. And the bees had found it, carried it away and were making, making honey out of it. So the principle should work. You could put food coloring in and try to track the syrup through your hive and see where it ends up. I think that would work, but I myself have never tried it and I don't know anyone who deliberately has done that. Thank you. This is a frame feeder. This is the same width and it has the little lips on the end, just like a frame that goes in the Langstroth hive. It has a wooden top to cover it up, but it has holes in the top and sticking through the holes are little plastic ladders, little uh, uh, perforated uh, plastic uh, cylinders. And the notion is that you can fill this with syrup and you can put a gallon, gallon and a half, two gallons. These come in different sizes. Those go right in the hive, usually at the end in the place of the number one or number 10 frame or the number one or number eight frame. Um, so it's right in the hive. The bees will crawl down uh, when the lid is on. The bees will crawl down those holes. They can lap up the syrup and they can crawl out uh, on the little plastic ladders. So hopefully bees will not drown. Anytime you provide a puddle of syrup anywhere near the bees, some of your bees are going to drown. Uh, that's the unfortunate thing about trying to provide a lot of syrup in one place is that it, the, the bees will get into it. They may not be able to crawl out. And bees will drown in these, but the ladders uh, reduce uh, the number of bees that are likely to uh, fall in and, and not be able to get out again. Uh, the downside of the frame feeders is that you have to open the entire hive in order to get to them, in order to see uh, whether they need refilling or cleaning. Uh, my notion was that you could drill a hole in the end of the feeder and uh, 
a, a silicone uh, uh, blew in a clear plastic pipe, run the clear plastic tubing out through a hole in the hive body and up so that the end of the tube was higher than the top of the feeder. Then you would have a visible valve, a visible gauge to see how much syrup was in, in the feeder from the outside, and you could also fill the feeder through that tube. And I think that idea has merit, but I haven't made it work yet. The other idea would be to put this kind of a frame feeder in a little annex, a little box that you attach to the side of your hive, and you'd need a hole or two for the bees to be able to get through. But again, if you put a hinged lid on top of your little annex box, you can flip it open, check the feeder, fill the feeder without ever actually opening uh, the bee, the, the box with the bees and the uh, brood in it. So I think there are some potential inventive improvements in the uh, frame feeder, but uh, as, as you buy them now, you put them in the hive and then you have to open the hive to be able to check on. This is a top tray feeder. This fits on the top of the hive rather like a super, rather like one of the medium supers. It has uh, two compartments in it, and there are these little wooden rafts that float on the syrup. The center is open. That little gap that you can see in the middle, that's where the bees can come up from below, and they can come up onto this thing, uh, move over onto the little rafts that are floating on the syrup and lap the syrup up from the little cracks in, in the rafts themselves. Now, the advantage here is this is all within the hive, and you can put a couple of gallons of syrup uh, into one of these boxes and have it sit on the top of the hive. So it certainly provides an ample uh, food source. Again, there will be some risk of the bees drowning uh, because there is a pool of syrup, even though it's covered up by these rafts. And there are several models of these. Some are plastic. Some have a screen that the bees can get down to the syrup, but hopefully crawl back up again. Some allow the bees to get in around the periphery with the syrup in the center. Uh, there are several different models, but basically this is a top tray feeder and you put it right on top of the, whatever the top box of the hive is and then put the covers, the inner and outer cover right on top of the tray feeder. This is a pail feeder. This will hold a gallon or more and it has a little uh, screen, uh, a little uh, screen in the center there. Um, and if you invert this over your inner cover, a typical inner cover has a hole in the middle of it, the, the uh, syrup accumulates but doesn't drip. Uh, it accumulates on that little central screen and the bees can come up and lap the uh, syrup uh, right from, from that screen. So this provides a gallon or two of syrup directly over the top of the hive. This is what I use. These are uh, mason jar feeders. And basically it's simply a um, piece of plywood with holes uh, cut in it that are the size of, in this case, wide mouth mason jars. That's about three inches. Uh, wide mouth, you can use quarts or half gallons and you can put several uh, quarts or half gallons onto uh, a single, uh, on a single hive. This is sitting on top of the inner cover it's raised up by uh, the little wood strips to create some space under the jars. The bees can come up through the hole in the inner cover and they can get to the syrup. And this would allow you, if you were using half gallons, to put uh, three gallons of syrup into a single hive at once. And if your bees are uh, very, very active, you'd be surprised how quickly three gallons of syrup will disappear. That's, a, that's also a a top feeder, but it's a mason jar feeder. And you could put a little uh, spacer, like an extra medium super around that and then put the lid uh, covers back on the hive. All right, so uh, questions about syrup feeding. If you have them, go ahead and raise your hand or put them in the chat. Okay, there's another way to feed sugar, and these are generally more popular in the winter, but you can certainly do them in other seasons in the beekeeping year. Um, and this is to create a cake, a sugar cake. Rather than suspending the sugar in water, we uh, make a patty out of, out of it and place it in the hive. Um, the simplest one is simply pouring granulated sugar into a tray and placing it uh, in the hive on top of the uh, 
uppermost frames, perhaps. And that's just granulated sugar. And sometimes the bees will go ahead and, and take it and uh, accept it. And sometimes they consider it to be uh, something that shouldn't be in the hive and they uh, dispose of it. And you find piles of sugar out in front of the hive where they've cleared it out. Uh, but that's the uh, least troublesome way to put sugar in the hive. And some people do that over the winter with a tray of granulated sugar uh, on, top of, on top of the hive accessible to the bees. You can also spray the sugar with water and let it dry. And that water could also have some uh, essential oils, some herbal essences uh, in it. And uh, you let it harden just like sugar in the bottom of a paper bag that gets wet and hardens into a cake. Uh, and then uh, you can put that in, into the hive and it won't be loose. And bees will need a source of water to be able to use it, but bees often can get water from condensed water in the hive in the winter. Um, so no cooked sugar cake is another alternative. Uh, you can make a cake with confectioner sugar. And I know Catherine has done this with great success. Um, it was about four pounds of powdered sugar and you gradually add water to it and you knead it as if you were kneading bread and gradually, and it only takes a small amount of water. You'd be surprised how little water will make a nice cake. Um, you knead it until it becomes kind of glossy and elastic and soft and fairly moist. And then you can place that in the hive and the bees will uh, go after the confectioner sugar and they do just fine with that. And that can be done any time of year, but again, more often in the winter than, than in the summer. Um, some people have worried that most confectioner sugar contains cornstarch and cornstarch is not digestible to bees. I'm not aware that anybody has reported problems if they use confectioner sugar instead of granulated sugar, but you will see some comments about that of people who've expressed some concern. Very hard to find powdered sugar that doesn't have cornstarch in it. They put it in there as an anti-caking uh, amendment to the sugar um, so that it won't uh, stick together. And we want it to stick together um, so that we can make, make a sugar cake. And finally, there's a thing called fondant. And fondant is sugar syrup that has been heated up. And then as it cools, we whip some air into it. So it becomes somewhat taffy-like. And the nice thing about this is that you can mold it. You can pour it into a mold. You could even pour it into an inner cover and then flip the inner cover so that the candy side is down and accessible to the bees in the box immediately beneath the cover. Um, and there are some recipes for fondant and there are quite a number of different ways to, to do it. Uh, this particular one uses uh, sugar and vinegar. So there's some acid in there. Uh, this, this author added some minerals, a little bit of citric acid, a little bit of honey be healthy. You could add some vitamins. And basically, they mix this up in, uh, with a paint mixing paddle in a bucket um, and made a dry cake out of it, which they dehydrated either in a food dehydrator or put it out in the greenhouse for a couple of weeks. And this was a no-cooked cook sugar cake. I think that came from the Washington State uh, Beekeepers Association newsletter. On not recipes, these are cooked. It's a little bit like making taffy. Uh, there are a variety of recipes, but basically water and sugar uh, heated up towards the hardball stage and then uh, poured out into a mold and uh, allowed to set. You can put uh, these into muffin uh, tins and drop individual muffins uh, into the hive uh, if you need to over the winter, or you could make a whole flat plate uh, cake of fondant and layer that in uh, again, often on the underside of the uh, inner cover. If you're doing this in Cheyenne, remember that our elevation, the temperatures for sea level are gonna have to change. You need to subtract a couple of degrees for every thousand feet uh, of elevation. There are a couple more fondant recipes. This one used some corn syrup in addition to the sugar. And uh, again, we heat it up toward uh, the hardball stage and then beat it with a whisk as it's cooling to get some air into it and make that taffy like uh, appearance. Another one used some uh, lemon juice, a little bit of essential oil, dissolved the sugar, uh, cooled it in some ice water and beat it with a paddle. You can see that although the recipes are a little different, the basic idea is all the same. We end up with a taffy like uh, cake that's uh, aerated to some extent and uh, yeah, can be molded into whatever shape uh, will fit nicely into your hive. 
Okay, so that was feeding sugar. Let's talk now about substituting a feeding protein uh, to substitute for pollen. Honeybees collect pollen and they chew it up and digest it and they create bee bread, which is stored, uh, multicolored. I think we saw some pictures in uh, Carolina's presentation of the multicolored pollen that's being stored. It is predominantly used to feed the larva and feed the young bees during the first week or two of their, their lives outside of the capped cells. They grade pollens uh, according to quality, and that can be based on the percentage of protein, but also the amino acid profile and how complete the profile of amino acids is. Uh, fruit trees, willows, clover are considered to be excellent. Interestingly, corn is considered to be a high quality uh, pollen, although bees often don't have a whole lot of interest in corn pollen. Uh, corn is wind pollinated, and so the corn plants have not tried to uh, evolve to be particularly attractive to honeybees. Uh, but the pollen is relatively high in protein. Uh, elm, cottonwood, dandelion, these are considered good quality. Uh, alder and hazelnut, fair, but pine pollen is not a very high quality. Bees will use it when there's nothing else available, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't have a high uh, amount of protein. If you are lucky enough to live uh, around a grove of willows or next to fields of uh, clover, your bees are probably gonna be very happy. So we would like to feed our bees pollen if we could. And it's possible to collect pollen one year and use it the next. The problem is that pollen has to be treated rather carefully if it is not to lose its nutritional value. Exposure to moisture, exposure to sunlight, uh, even just storage at room temperature will lead to deterioration and uh, the degradation of some of the amino acid components in the pollen. Pollen ideally should be flash frozen very quickly and uh, protected from light. I go into the natural food store and I see little envelopes of pollen, very expensive pollen, by the way, being sold as a human nutritional supplement, and they're hanging on the end of the shelf aisle in the sunlight. Uh, I very much doubt that there's a lot of nutritional value in those, uh, uh, the way they're, the, that that pollen is being handled. And purchasing pollen is expensive. And if we don't know where the pollen came from, it could transmit diseases, it could contain pesticides or herbicides. So um, we're looking for substitutes for pollen. Although if you collect your own pollen, and there is a thing called a pollen trap that you can put on the entrance to your hive, that knocks some of the pollen off the bee's legs as they come into the hive, and you can collect that and process it and get it frozen pretty quickly, uh, you can save pollen and you can give it back to your bees the following, following season. We're basically looking for a substitute for the proteins that are in pollen and there, no pollen is perfect, but no substitute is perfect either. The most common one is soy flour. And soy flour is pretty good, but not not ideal. It's, it's uh, lacking in some of the amino acids that we would prefer to be present. But there are many other sources of protein that could be used and that the bees will accept. Dry milk, brewer's yeast, oriolo yeast, other plant proteins. Uh, Natural uh, Foods has uh, jars of pea-derived protein used as a human nutritional supplement. Fried eggs, canola flour, baker's yeast, fish meal, sunflower meal, peanut meal, and milk proteins. Um, so there are a variety of different choices. And my sense is that using more than one is probably helpful because it will help to improve the overall amino acid profile as opposed to using a single source of protein in your, your supplement. Often these are mixed with sugar syrup to make a moist patty that can simply be laid across the frames of the hive. You would like to get your protein uh, patties as close as possible to the brood. If you have two deep boxes, but the brood are mostly in the lower box, you would like to lay these across the top of the frames in the lower box, not in the upper box. You want them to be just centimeters away from where the nurse bees are going to be collecting the protein and feeding it to the larva. Okay, when do we feed protein? Um, now, this question came up, I think, earlier uh, in the presentation. Is it too early to begin feeding uh, protein? 
And the answer to that depends a little bit on what your local climate is like. In some parts of Colorado, people are already putting protein into the hives and may have even started as early as January, uh, depending on the microclimate. For I think most of uh, Wyoming, Nebraska, it's going to be February or March that we will start to add protein patties to, uh, to the hive. And we're trying to support the development of, of brood and allow the queen to ramp up her uh, egg laying. Uh, she usually begins to lay eggs again. She stops for a month or two. It is said after the uh, winter solstice is when the queen begins to lay again, but uh, to really begin to lay at the rate of 1,500 or 2,000 eggs a day requires that there be nectar and pollen or nectar and pollen substitutes available in the hive. Um, so I put protein patties on my hives about two weeks ago, uh, toward the end of February or so. And then of course we got a six day snowstorm. <laughs> but hopefully once the bees uncluster again, they'll be able to take advantage of, of the uh, protein patties in the hive and put the patties directly over the brood nest. Sometimes it will be helpful to have a little spacer box there uh, so that the uh, next upper box or the lid doesn't squash, uh, crush the patty. And I use the same rule of thumb. If the bees are covering your patty and they're eating it and devouring it, then keep supplying patties. And when they start ignoring it and the patties get dry and moldy and the bees have no interest in them, they're finding enough pollen elsewhere and you can probably stop. But if you begin to supplement uh, protein in the spring, don't let it run out. You've encouraged the bees to raise more brood. And now they need protein to keep that brood developing well. If you put a protein patty in, they eat it all up and you don't refill it and there are not protein pollen sources available outside the hive, they are going to not be able to keep that brood going and they may even cannibalize the eggs and the larva. Um, so you have set your hive back. So once you begin to supplement until there is a pollen available elsewhere in your environment, keep, keep make sure that the patties continue to be available. Okay, how about feeding protein in the, in the fall? Well, one of the triggers for the queen to begin to lay winter bee eggs, and winter bees differ from summer bees in a number of ways. They're longer lived, they tolerate cold better, they have bigger fat bodies, they have more vitellogelin. Um, one of the triggers for that is when the protein begins to dry up in the environment. And their fear is that if we feed protein in the fall, we may delay the queen's laying of winter eggs, which might harm the ability of the colony to get through the winter. And that's a reasonable idea. You will find that many of the manufacturers of protein patties have a winter formula and a spring or summer formula. And the winter formula has less protein in it to try and avoid that. The interesting thing is that when it was tested, whether that happens or not, it didn't make any difference. Um, a researcher uh, supplied protein to one set of hives and uh, deprived the other set of hives of protein. And there was indeed a delay of the onset of the laying of winter bee eggs in the hives that had the extra protein. So that was true. But when she checked the population of the hives in midwinter, they were essentially equal. So the hive that had delayed the onset of the uh, laying of winter bee eggs had caught up, perhaps because they had ample protein available. So I don't think you have to stop, uh, to have to avoid feeding protein in the fall. Uh, you are hoping that there will be ample resources to feed the brood and to uh, create a good population of bees in the winter. Um, but if you're feeding uh, commercial uh, patties, you may purchase the winter patties, which have about half of the protein content of the usual summer patties. Oops. Okay, um, let me make sure that I'm, yes, okay, commercial protein patties, there we go. I... Ah, um, you can buy uh, protein patties from any of the bee supply uh, companies, um, and uh, they often will have a couple of different formulations. Uh, you can purchase this as a dry product, and then you make your own uh, sugar uh, syrup to make a moist patty and you mix the dry product in with uh, your syrup and make your own patties from that. That's probably an economical way to purchase a protein supplement. Um, you can purchase pre-made patties that are already 
uh, have have uh, been mixed with syrup. And many of the manufacturers are including vitamins and probiotics and essential oils into their, their mix. So for example, Ultra B Dry is 54% protein and you're expected to dilute that with your own syrup. The patties are 18% protein or the moist patties, 15% protein. And those would be the summer patties. Um, AP23 is another brand. Uh, dry is 47% protein. The winter patties are only 4% protein. And there are many, many manufacturers of these. Brood Builder Vita B, we heard Sebastian Owen from Vita B uh, gave one of our talks earlier this year. Uh, Mega B, Global Patties, B Pro, so on. Which commercial patty is the best? Hard to say. Andy Oliver ran a test in which he, he tried eight different formulations of patties. Some of those were commercial and some were homemade. And he found that although the bees that were fed protein did better than the bees that weren't fed protein, there weren't any statistically significant differences among his different formulations. However, those bees were outdoors and they did have access to natural pollen, which bees tend to prefer to anything that we can put in the hive for them. So it may be that uh, that confounded his results. And I think he's actually uh, proposing to do this experiment again under a little bit more controlled conditions. Um, but Many different sources of protein appear to be acceptable to the bees and offer the uh, similar benefits. So recipes for homemade patties. These are all over the map. Uh, I don't expect you to, to copy them all down. But basically, uh, you can use soybean flour, brewer's yeast, uh, dry milk, uh, actual natural pollen can be added. and uh, may make uh, the uh, patty a little more palatable to the bees. Um, and basically you mix these with sugar and water and you end up with, with a moist patty. Uh, the books will tell you that expeller processed uh, soy flour has lower fat content than solvent expressed soy flour. I asked a couple of grocers if their soy flour was expeller, professed, uh, expeller processed and they didn't know. <laughs> so <laughs> I think you'll take the soy flour you can get your hands on. Uh, you can make up your own recipe and put in vitamins or oils or probiotics if you wish. My suggestion would be that more than one source of protein is better than a single source of protein. So if you are mixing it up, uh, put some soy flour and yeast and dry milk and uh, any other uh, vegetable protein source that you, you can find. And here are a few more and you can see that these are all fairly similar. Sugar, yeast, eggs, water, this one added some vegetable oil and lemon juice, a uh, 4% uh, patty that had just a little of the dry pollen substitute mixed in and mixed some corn syrup in with the sugar and water. Um, and you can double the amount of the powdered protein supplement if you are uh, going for an 8% patty instead of the 4% protein patty. Oops. Okay, any questions about feeding protein to the bees? I don't see any questions coming in right now, but again, everybody, if you've got questions, you're welcome to raise your hand, unmute, or put a question down in the chat box. Um, you also are gonna to need to have a source of water for the bees. The bees will go out and forage for water and they will bring water back to the hive. If you're using a tray feeder or a jar feeder, you can put water in one of the jars or water in one side of the tray and they will have water right in the hive. But generally they're going to be looking around for a water source outside of the hive. And this is where if you folks run into trouble with their neighbors because the neighbor has a leaky faucet that's dripping nice, fresh, moving water and the bees find that very attractive. Or there's a kiddie pool or there's a bird bath and your bees go over to their house to get their water and this causes a lot of ruckus and sometimes leads to ordinances in the city against people having bees. So you want to supply a source of water uh, close, closer to the bees than your neighbors are and, and hope that the bees will uh, fixate on that and they will learn where it is and they will use it. Again, you can use a bird bath or a chicken waterer uh, with pebbles or a coil of rope in it uh, you can make a little um, floating uh, pond garden in a half barrel with lily pads and the bees can land on the lily pads and get the water. 
You can use a stock tank or a, a, a trough, uh, water trough, but put some floats in it, some styrofoam or uh, something that will give the bees a place to stand so that it's not just a broad pool of water that they could land in and drown. Um, circulating water is more attractive than stagnant water uh, in general, and you can purchase a little uh, solar uh, fountain that will help move the water around in a barrel or uh, in, in, your, um, in your stock tank. Uh, and that will also make, make the uh, water a little more attractive to the bees if there's some movement going on. Um, but do make sure that the bees have some source of water or they will find one that you may not like. Um, People complain that they provide nice, clean, fresh water to the bees, and the bees persist in going and finding stinky, icky water somewhere around. Maybe it's in the pigsty. Uh, maybe it's a manure pile. Uh, they seem to be attracted to tubs that have chlorinated water in them. And what seems to be happening is the bees are foraging for salt as well as water. And they do uh, collect uh, salts, sodium chloride, calcium, all through the uh, bee beekeeping season. Um, in fact, in tests, when they were offered pure water or varying uh, concentrations of salty water, the bees actually preferred slightly salty water. I do not salt my syrup. Uh, I'm not sure that anybody does, but in the experiment, the bees liked the slightly brackish salty water over the, the pure clean water. Uh, animal manures uh, uh, contain salts and animal feeds may have molasses or sweeteners in them. And that makes the animal feces attractive to the honeybees. Um, some beekeepers will take a little chunk of a salt block uh, as used for livestock and put it in a pan and put it out somewhere near the, the hives. A little bit of water may accumulate at the bottom of the pie pan and hopefully that will provide some uh, salt forage for the bees. Uh, although it's hard to dissuade them from going to the place where they find something sweet or something salty that they can collect. So before your bees arrive, make your plans, have water available, have syrup and a way to feed the syrup and have protein patties available. Um, have any spacer boxes that you might need and set up your water source. So right. David? Yes. Um, so when you make the pollen patties, is there a difference when you put them, when you lay them out on paper, does it matter what the paper is? Should it be like, like parchment paper or wax paper? Michael Jordan pours them in yeah. muffin tins, and then he's got a whole tube that he right. drops them down in. Does it? Right. Um, the what about the paper? Putting them, the reason for putting them in paper is simply to keep the patty moist for longer. Once it gets really dried out and dehydrated, the bees tend to lose interest. So for that reason, wax paper. Uh, paper that is, is going to retain some of the moisture in the patty is probably ideal, as opposed to, say, newspaper or something of that sort. Um, the bees will chew through the paper to get to the, the patty itself, so you don't necessarily have to peel it off. There actually were some experiments, and the larger the surface area of the patty, the more bees will, uh, will use it. Um, so it's kind of belly up to the bar for the bees, and rather than a, a thick chunk of uh, uh, protein patty, a rather thin uh, platter of protein patty that covers most of the top of the hive will actually get more bee action uh, for the same amount of the patty. Okay, so the bees will just chew right through that paper, right? The bees chew right through the paper to get to, to, get to the patty. Uh, some people, I guess, make little razor slits in the paper, but I don't know that that's really necessary. Um, if, they want, if they want it, they will get to it. Okay, and then um, I've been told to provide a half an orange to my bees. Do this actually help? Well, uh, that's, that's interesting. It has moisture, it's sweet, so it's a kind of natural syrup, and it has some vitamin C. Um, so those things might be good. Is it better than any other way of supplying sweet syrup and vitamin C to the bees? I don't know. Uh, do, the, do you notice the bees cover the uh, orange and, and are, uh, are they collecting uh, 
orange juice from, from the sliced orange? That would be the that would be the test is to watch the orange and see what happens to it and hope the ants don't find it first and carry it off. <laughs> it's always an issue when you put syrup or tasty stuff into your hive. All right, I'm gonna go on to the second part here and talk about some tools and accessories. Um, I wanted to make this practical. So basically um, in face-to-face -face meetings, this is a demonstration and we hand these around. You get to heft them in your hand. You get to turn them over, look at the front side, the back side. Unfortunately, we're reduced to pictures on a virtual talk. And that's kind of like looking at a catalog and a B catalog, which is actually not a bad idea. And I would suggest that particularly if you're a newcomer to beekeeping, take 30 or 60 minutes and go online and take a look at some of the bee supply catalogs. They're full of information. Uh, they will plug their own products, but despite that, they tell you a lot of good and accurate beekeeping information and you get to see the sort of things that are available. Um, you don't have to buy everything that's in the catalog to begin with. I was thinking of uh, in backpacking, when you lay out all the things you want to take on your backpacking trip, you end up with 200 pounds of stuff to try to put in your backpack and you obviously can't take all of that. So the backpackers say, sort it out into the necessities, the amenities and the luxuries. Necessities, you better have those. The amenities make it easier and nice for you and the luxuries are just you know, pure fun and make your life easier. Um, and I think you can probably sort out your beekeeping tools in the, the same uh, categories here. Um, so what I thought I would do is say, uh, what do you need as a little kit to have handy when your bees arrive? And I'll assume that you're going to be installing some bees uh, in the spring from a packager and duke. Uh, maybe you overwintered and you're going to be inspecting your hive uh, when the weather warms up. Uh, but here are things that you might uh, want to do before those bees are here and you need to deal with them. You need a place to put your hive some sort of a stand to get the hive up off the ground, a bottom board, that's what makes the bottom of the hive. It can be solid wood or it can be a piece of screen, uh, eight, eight uh, squares to the, to the inch. You will need a brood box. And I'm thinking that you have a Langstroth type hive that's a stack of boxes and you need frames to go in your brood box. It could be a deep or a medium. Or if you have a horizontal hive, that will be one big box and you'll have frames and a, a follower board that go into that. You need some sort of a cover, and usually that's an inner cover and a telescoping cover. Telescoping cover is just the big outer cover that overlaps the edges of the hive. You'll need an entrance reducer because your first colony is pretty small, and you don't want them to have to defend the full width of the entrance of the hive. So this is a little a wooden strip with a notch in it that reduces the size of the entrance to something that they can defend, they can manage. You'll need some sort of way to feed syrup some sort of source of water and a protein patty. You might need some extra boxes or spacers. And although it's not a piece of equipment, you need a plan for how you're going to sample for varroa mites. How are you gonna do that? And what are you going to do if you find them? You need some sort of a plan, some sort of a management plan to deal with, with mites after you have sampled and discovered that you have mites in your hive. If you have no mites in your hive, Wait a while, they'll be there. So that's a necessity is to be able to know how you're gonna sample for mites and how you're gonna treat them. And that's a whole nother talk. So I'm not gonna say much more about that, but it is something that you should be thinking about before your bees arrive. Okay, if you're gonna install your bees, here's a little kit that might be handy to have. You need some sort of personal protective equipment. That can be just a hat with a veil it can be a veil and a jacket, or it can be a whole full coverage moon suit. You'll need some gloves. And I recommend that you have garters. That doesn't necessarily mean the little black lace kind, although if you, those suit your fancy, that's fine. But the garter is a, a shoestring, uh, a little elastic cuff, a hair scrunchie, something that you can put over your cuffs so that the bees will have a harder time burrowing under the cuffs. The bees are pretty good at trying to get at this person who's bothering the hive and they will try to burrow under your outfit. And it can be disconcerting to find that the bees have managed to find a, a space between your cuff and your shoe and are now crawling up your pant leg and toward the Northern regions. Uh, that can uh, 
interrupt your concentration when you're inspecting the hive. So, uh, so a, a little elastic garter that will snap your cuff down uh, over your boot is a handy thing to have. Uh, you can have a spray bottle, but it better not have soap uh, in it. And that can have one-to-one -one sugar syrup. Uh, you can spray the uh, bees in their um, box. If you've got a, um, you don't need this if you have a nuke, but if you've got a package, sometimes you want to spray some sugar syrup just on the screen. You don't want to soak the bees, but uh, give them something to lap up. And that makes them a little less hungry and a little less irritable before you go to transfer them into your hive. Uh, lemongrass essential oil mimics the uh, uh, Naranov pheromone, and that's what bees use to label uh, places that are good, uh, food sources, water sources, a uh, new home when swarming. Uh, so a drop or two of lemongrass in the hive may make it more uh, appealing to the bees you're trying to install. A uh, pushpin, a nail, or some duct tape, you're going to be hanging your queen cage uh, in, in the, uh, between two frames, and often it doesn't want to cooperate unless you've got a way to pin it or tape it in place. Uh, having a pen knife, pocket knife, kitchen tongs, uh, long kitchen tongs like the large pair of tweezers um, are very handy if you should drop your queen cage to the bottom of the box and you don't want to lift all the frames out and reach in with your hand, you may be able to fish it out with your kitchen tongs. Ask me how I know that. You need a mini marshmallow if you're going to do the delayed release. You're going to replace the cork in the end of the queen cage with a little marshmallow that they can chew through and let the queen out, but it'll take a day or two. They can get used to her and her smell in the meantime. If possible, if you have a frame of old brood comb, that makes the new hive more appealing. And you may want to hang up a bait hive or a swarm catcher. Uh, Michael talked a little bit about, about these. Uh, the simplest one is a five gallon bucket with a hole in the bottom and a little lemongrass oil inside. The notion is if the bees swarm, you would like to have a place that will be appealing to them that they will swarm into and you can get your bees back. You might even collect some bees from somebody else whose bees have swarmed. And since packages are running at 160 bucks and nukes up to 200 or 240, uh, collecting a swarm is actually quite an economical uh, proposition. So you may want to have a, bee, a bait hive or two uh, hung up around the edges of your property. Um, where the bees will find them if they should choose to swarm or abscond. Okay, what's the single most important item to have with you when you first go to inspect your hive? You've installed the bees, you've let them settle down, the queen's out, she's laying eggs. A week or two later, you're going to go and check on the hive. What do you need to take with you? My answer is you need a helper. It's hard to do this alone. You're going to be in a bee suit. You're going to be lifting the boxes and lifting out the frames. You're going to be trying to see clearly through your veil. You're wondering if the bees are going to sting you. They're buzzing around. You're not sure what you're seeing in the hive. You're supposed to be taking notes. Where's your notebook? Where's your pen? What happened to the paper? Um, you, this is not easy to do alone. So find a helper, maybe another beekeeper, maybe your hubby, a family member, uh, but someone who can suit up in protective gear, and they can stand a little ways away from the hive. They don't have to be right in the middle of the cloud of bees, um, but they can take notes for you. You can call out what you see, um, and that will just make life a whole lot easier. Four pairs of eyes uh, on the bees instead of two. Uh, you'll find that your inspections go much more smoothly, and you get much better records of what you've seen. So try to enlist a helper, but here's a part of a kit for your first hive inspection. Personal protective gear, whatever suits you. I again recommend the full bee suit to start with, but if you're spending a lot of time in the bee yard, you might want to go with a little lighter uh, gear. Well, to look at a hive tool, a bee brush, the smoker, fuel for the smoker, a lighter for the smoker, a bucket, put the smoker in so that you don't set your hot smoker down on the grass and have it fall over in the dry grass. A notebook, a pen, some inspection sheets that you can record your findings on and frame lifter, a little tool to help you lift the frame out of the hive. Frame rest, some place to put the frame while you have it out of the hive and are looking at it. A frame spacer, if by chance, like Michael, you're going to be doing nine frames in a 10 frame box. That helps you space the nine frames evenly. And it's very handy to have a hive scale. Uh, the changes of weight of your hive give you a lot of information about what's going on inside the hive. 
So let's look at a couple of these things. Oh, here's some more, an empty tin can. Why? Because you're gonna be scraping some wax, burr comb and uh, wax that's in the wrong place. And you don't wanna just throw that on the ground where it will attract wax moths or predators. You wanna collect that in an empty tin can. So bring a tin can with you and collect your wax in there. You can render it later and make something out of the beeswax. A jar with some water and some bleach in it. This is to sanitize your hive tool. Dip your hive tool, dip your frame lifter in the bleached water in between hives if you're inspecting more than one. A piece of cardboard, what's that for? Well, you can set it on the ground and that way if you put your lids, your boxes on the ground as you lift them off the hive, they won't get covered with dirt and grass that the bees have to clean out later. So a piece of cardboard will keep all that stuff clean while it's on the ground. You might need some extra boxes or frames, extra lid, uh, a nuke box if you think you might be making a split. It's handy to have a toolbox to put all this stuff in. Uh, queen clip is a little tool I'll show you, which allows you, if you see the queen, to catch her without having to pinch her between your fingers and will hold her long enough for you to mark her or just to separate her from the rest of the hive while you're inspecting. Uh, tweezers, scissors, a little vial of alcohol. Sometimes what you see is, hey, there's a strange bug in my hive. I don't know what it is. Grab it with the tweezers, drop it in the vial of alcohol and bring it back, take a photo of it and put it up online and see if anybody knows what creature is visiting your hive. A little hammer and nails if you might have to repair a frame if the frame comes apart during your inspection. Duct tape is always handy and a kit for stings. You have scented alcohol wipes, why? Because as Dr. Nairati said, the bees label you when they sting you with a pheromone that says you're an enemy of the hive and other bees should come and sting you. So you want the scented alcohol wipe and you want to wipe that sting area off with the, with the scented alcohol and, and dilute the pheromone. An old credit card, that's because we're going to flick the stinger out. We're not going to rub it. If you rub it, you'll release more venom into the, uh, through the stinger. So we're going to use the credit card and just zip that, that stinger out of your skin. Little anesthetic spray like cetacane can make it feel better. And many folks will carry an EpiPen. EpiPens are pretty expensive nowadays. And the number of folks who die from anaphylactic reactions to honeybees is extremely small. Your chances of being killed by lightning are higher. Your chances of being killed in an ambulance crash on the way to the hospital are higher than your chances of dying of anaphylactic shock from a honeybee sting. But if people, uh, if, you, if you are there and you, there's a possibility that you might have a severe reaction, uh, carry an EpiPen along with you and you'll need a prescription from your doc, but tell them you're a beekeeper and you wanna have one handy just in case. Index card, some folks like to tape an index card inside the telescope and cover so they can jot notes right on the hive itself. Extra syrup, extra patties in case the bees are running out. A mite check kit, and that's the subject of another talk as well, but. Uh, you're going to measure a half a cup of bees. Uh, you can take the bees into a white dish pan to collect your half a cup. You're going to have a little jar with a regular lid and a screen lid. And you're going to put your half cup of bees in the jar with a little powdered sugar or alcohol or soapy water. The alcohol and soapy water kill the bees. The powdered sugar doesn't. You're going to shake them and swirl them and knock the mites off. And then you're going to pour out the sugar or the alcohol or the soap. Uh, and you're going to look and count the number of mites that are there. And if you have a half a cup of bees and you've got nine mites or 12 mites or 15 mites, you better have a plan because you need to do something. Uh, otherwise, those mites are very likely to kill your colony within, if not this year, then probably another year. A uh, cell phone, some folks like to take pictures of their frames so that they can examine at their leisure without their veil on. And there are some interesting apps that you can use that will provide information about your hive through your, through your phone. And I like to have a card table or a TV tray because I don't like to bend down to the ground to lift those boxes back up. So if I can set up a card table and put the boxes and the gear on the table, I don't have to bend over quite so much. All right, here's a hat and a veil. It's lightweight if it's if you're hot in a regular suit. This is about as light as you can go, but the bees can get under that cowl. So um, it does not provide as much protection as a more comprehensive personal protective gear. This is a uh, 
veil plus a jacket. And a lot of folks find that more comfortable than the full bee suit, but uh, you'd wear, be wearing hopefully thick jeans uh, and you're depending on your pants and your socks and boots to protect the lower half of your body uh, with the jacket covering your upper half. I recommend the full moon suit, hazmat suit, um, just because I think it builds your confidence when you're working around the bees, certainly for the first couple of years. If you find that's uncomfortable and overly uh, restrictive, later on you can uh, dress down, do something smaller. Gloves, these are uh, typical beekeeping gloves. You don't have to have beekeeping gloves. You can use, uh, I, I at one point ran out to the store and got some welder's gloves. Those worked fine. Some people like uh, thick rubber gloves or polyurethane gloves. Uh, typical beekeeping gloves have some vents in them. So they're a little bit ventilated and they're made of a soft leather. Soft leather is hard to clean. It will get sticky with honey. It'll get sticky with propolis. You can try uh, cleaning and washing them, but that wears the leather up a little faster as well. But do get a good pair of gloves. Uh, stings on the hand are uh, painful. Hive tools. Hive tools are basically a little mini crowbar. They have lots of uses. They help you lift the frames out. They help you scrape off burr comb. Some of them have that little right angle bend. Uh, some of them have a hook. Uh, the hook can be used for scraping and for hook, hooking and lifting. Uh, some of them have an actual little hammer so that you can tap nails in if you need to using that same tool. You don't have to buy a hive tool. You could use an old screwdriver. You could use a, a, a little crowbar from the toolbox. But the hive tool is kind of the emblem of the beekeeper. And so uh, this, is, this is part of what defines you as a beekeeper is you have your personal hive tool and you should look at them and find one that you really like. Um, you'll find that it's very handy to have when you're trying to open up a hive. A bee brush. These have soft nylon bristles. They will allow you to sweep some of the bees off the frame without shaking or rattling the frame. Uh, that lets you see a little better what's going on in the combs um, and hopefully will not harm, harm the bees. Uh, so soft nylon uh, bee brush. Smokers. I recommend that you have a smoker. Uh, not everyone uses them. Some people spray syrup instead, but I think smokers do calm the bees down, make you more confident. They come in a variety of ways, but they all have a little burning chamber plus a bellows. You fill them up with fuel. I use uh, trimmings from my trim saw with sawdust. You can use shavings, uh, pine needles, uh, cow patties. Um, get them in there, get a good smolder going, get some nice white smoke coming out and uh, use it dis discreetly. You don't have to uh, smother the bees with smoke, but uh, a smoker will make your life easier when you're looking at your hives. And inspection sheets. You can buy these uh, from the bee supply companies in tablets, uh, but you can also get them online. This particular one was from the Eastern Missouri Beekeepers Association and you can print it out free online. And it simply has questions and boxes for you to check as you look at your hive. It's got a front and a back um, and it makes your record keeping a whole lot easier when you go back a month later and you wonder, gee, I, uh, how, many, how many bees did I have in that hive? And how many frames were covered with uh, um, drawn comb and so on? It's very handy to have a record. This is the back side of that same sheet which has a little diagram for three deep boxes and three honey supers, and you can make notes about the individual frames on this template. Frame lifter is just a device that allows you to reach in, grab the top bar of the frame and help you lift it out without sticking your fingers down in the spaces between the frames. And for that reason, it's rather handy and less likely to damage the bees because they can get out of the way of those little uh, teeth that go down and grip the frame and allow you to, to uh, compress the handle and lift the frame up out of the hive. I kind of like this one, which has a little broader grip on it, but the broader grip also takes up a little more room. So you have to be a little more careful not to crush the bees as you lift the frame out. This is a frame rest. It's a little metal uh, rack that just clips onto the box and gives you a, a space to hang the frames that you have taken out of the hive. 
it'll hold about four or five uh, frames. And so you can lift out a couple, hang them on the rest, and then you can work the rest of the frames without necessarily removing them from the box. You, this one, you can move from uh, box to box, or you can put one on each of your hives so that it's always there for the next time you go to inspect. And that's a frame rest. This is a frame spacer. Uh, Michael was telling us that uh, he uses nine frames in a 10 frame box. Many folks do that with their honey supers because if the bees build up a, a thick wax in the honey super, it's easier to uncap uh, and get the honey out. Uh, unfortunately, if you only put nine frames in a 10 frame box to begin with, the bees will probably build a lot of burr comb, bridge comb, because you haven't given them the appropriate bee space. So typically, uh, if you wanted to run a nine frame super, you'd start with 10 frames, let the bees draw comb on those 10 frames, and then take out one frame and space the rest uh, evenly, the nine frames evenly, and then they'll add a little comb uh, to that, and that will give you that thick comb, which is nice when you go to, to harvest your honey. The hive scale, this one is the brood binder. It sits under the hive and this one is Bluetooth uh, activated. So it'll give you a continuous readout of your hive weight. Uh, the hive gains weight when the more bees are uh, made, when more bees are collecting nectar and pollen, it loses weight when they swarm. Uh, and sometimes that, sometimes it's hard to tell if your hive swarmed. It still looks pretty full of bees, but if you have a hive scale, uh, and you are continuously measuring hive weight, you're gonna get a lot of information about what's happening inside the hive. When, are the, when is it building up? When is it dwindling down? And so on. Uh, this this uh, brood binder you use um, under each individual hive, but there are also hive scales that you can move from hive to hive. You lift the hive with the scale and it registers the weight uh, for you. So you can use it the same tool on multiple uh, different hives. Okay, the can, the bleach, the cardboard, the extra boxes. I think we talked about those. Cool box, very handy. Keep all your stuff in one place. Sanitize your tools in between hives and after your inspection, before the next inspection. Make sure that the tools are not carrying disease from one hive to the other. This is a queen clip. It's a little uh, plastic or metal device. If you see the queen and you open the clip and you can surround her with the clip and close it, she will be in there without your having to actually pinch her or grab her with your hand. And you can then mark her through the uh, little uh, spaces in the clip, or you can just put her in your pocket, keep her warm, so that you're confident that you're not going to injure her while you go through the rest of the hive. Okay, let's see. We talked about tweezers and scissors, alcohol vial, hammer, duct tape, sting treatment, Index cards, extra syrup, light check kit. So, so David. Yes. At this at this point, why don't we keep the mites to a second oh, sure. later on program? Because I think okay. that would be very helpful. Because that's I'll a complicated look. topic is the mites. Yeah. I got about two more slides here. Um, things you can do with your cell phone. You can take pictures of uh, your frames, or if you see something that you don't understand. You can take a frame, uh, take a picture and, and send it through the Beekeepers Association or to one of the question and answer bee labs, uh, University Bee Labs. Um, there are a bunch of apps now. Some of them are recording apps that are designed to help you collect information from your inspection by recording it on the app. Uh, there also is one that lets you take a 30 second audio. Michael mentioned he put cell phones in his hives and listened uh, to what they were doing. This app will uh, take a 30 second recording and it says it will tell you one of eight conditions in the hive. Uh, normal situation, queenlessness, preparing to swarm based on the sound profile, the sound spectrum being generated by the hive. I haven't tried it, but it sounds very, very interesting. Um, there's also a queen bee detector on Android. You can put a cell phone picture in there and artificial intelligence will attempt to find the queen in your picture. Of course, by the time it's analyzed your picture, the queen may not be where she was before. That also sounds rather fascinating. And the card table. Um, okay, other accessories. Yeah, there are a bunch. I'm not gonna go through all this today because we're just about out of time. 
I will mention that, uh, let's zip through some of this. Um, for more information on bee nutrition, uh, online there is a manual uh, published by the Australian government, Fat Bees, Skinny Bees, which tells you a lot about bee nutrition. There's also a slideshow by the author of Fat Bees, Skinny Bees, uh, also on uh, honeybee nutrition. And if you look in Hive and Honeybee, there is a whole chapter on honeybee nutrition, another chapter on production of nectar and pollen by uh, pollen and nectar producing plants, a uh, chapter on bee forage, and a whole chapter on beekeeping equipment, which covers a lot of these accessories. So, we got a minute or two for questions. Any, any questions out there? David, you are incredibly thorough. Um, from Renee, she says, I use a stethoscope to check in the middle of the winter. And I, and I certainly have used a stethoscope. They, they're not very expensive. Uh, at, le at least not the ones that um, are non-medical use. <laughs> so ideally, ideally, you will be able to hear a bit of a hum. Uh, because the uh, bees in the cluster, even though they are not terribly active, they do uh, create sound. If you don't hear a hum, it is said that you can knock on the side of the hive, and that may stimulate the cluster just enough for you to then uh, have it be audible. You don't want to disturb them so much that they break cluster and have to get back. Uh, it would take some time to get back into the cluster. But yes, that is certainly one way to try to determine if there are still live bees inside the hive. Okay. <laughs> David, that was a, an awesome program and there's so much information to know. I mean, we just hit the tip of the iceberg on bee nutrition and feeding your bees and taking care of your bees. And then of course, you know, like any hobby, you can never have too many tools to go with that and I actually have a little wagon that I fill full of my stuff and and hike off to my bee yard right so that that little wagon is very handy carry everything once you've got your bee suit on and your smoker going you hate to have to come back to the house because you forgot something that you really need out there and then by that time your smoker is smoldering and you got to pump that up again and so on it's much easier to have everything nicely in place in your box or your wagon and have it all where you where you want it before you open your very first hive. Yep, absolutely. So with that, we're going to take just a little bit of a break, like a five minute break, and then we'll come back. And then Paul Anderson's coming on and he has Prairie Winds Bee Supply and he is a sales nuts and packages and he's going to talk about how to install that package so i from reading the comments throughout the day i know a lot of you are getting your first package ever and so paul is going to talk about how to take that buzzing box and install it into your hive so five minutes we'll be back Thank you, David. And for everybody who's still kind of paying attention, David will be back on to talk about building a pollinator habitat and using wildflowers. That'll be March 25th at 6.30. And I put the address, the, the URL in to the chat box. And I'll put it in again a second time. And then also I've got a little survey um, evaluation for everybody. And if you'd fill that out for me too at the end of the program, that would be wonderful. And I will remind everybody once again later about the upcoming program on March 25th and also the evaluation. So just a quick break. Do you want that evaluation filled out after each presentation or at the end of the day?
Well, welcome back, everybody. We'll get started here with our program. And again, this is with Paul Anderson. And Paul is on. Paul, are you, <laughs> are you there? Just had to find the right unmute button here. So, okay. <laughs> coming through all right now? Yep. Okay, we're, we're trying this uh, set up, so try not to make the seasick while I get positioned. But um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we want to talk about a few different things, um, primarily about getting new bees. But I'm going to actually demonstrate the installation of bees, and we'll talk about different uh, options and different uh, things in that regard. Um, what I want to talk about first is the way that you buy bees. Um, there are several different ways that you can buy bees these days. Um, one is a uh, one is a package. Another is a nuke, which um, I'll go into detail on all these. And the third one that we offer is a colony. Um, this year we're offering a colony it's it's on 12 frames it's two six frame nukes one on top of the other boxes and a, a large colony so um so that's that's the three different types and i'm going to talk today just about the packages and the nukes and demonstrate those um, for you so um first thing i want to talk about is two different ways that you can get a package the um the traditional um, wooden package is uh, looks like this, um, contains three pounds of bees. Um, you see the little box hanging there? That's a queen cage. Um, so she's in the, in the package when you get it. Um, this can right here in the middle is a feed can. I'll talk about different types of feed cans that you might encounter. And um, the screen is stapled on to the sides here, so they shouldn't escape in your car. Um, as you're uh, taking them home. Um, another, uh, another way that you can get them, the way that we sell them, is in a bee bus. And these are, this is two packages together. Um, I wanted to talk about how you separate these um, because uh, it, that can be a little bit of a battle um, dealing with the plastic. Um, is a little bit different from, uh, from the wood. So if I have two packages here, um, you can see they're, they're bridged together right here by these two connectors here. Those actually slide one with respect to the other. And so if I take this here, I block down here on this one, and I just pop it up here, that's going to separate those two. So if you're getting more than one package, um, you're going to need to be able to get those separated. And when you do that, that's going to shake the bees up um, and kind of get them moving. So if you're if you're heading home, um, it might be a good idea to separate your packages before you you know a few minutes before you go to put them in the hive. Um, let, let's talk a little bit now about the anatomy of the um, of the packages. Um, Dave was talking about hive tools. This is my favorite um, type. It's a J hook hive tool. Um, it's just, it fits what I, it's comfortable for me, I guess, is, is what I would need to say. But the wooden cage is going to come with uh, a board across the top here to hold this feed can in, or maybe a, a piece of thin plywood like, like the top over it, so that, uh, you know, to keep that in and to keep the, the queen trapped. So you'll probably need to pry that off. So you'll need something to do that with. And then you'll need to get the, the can out. Most of the cans in the wooden packages, you, you've got to get under the edge there. And so I'm just using the edge of my hive tool to, to get that. Now remember, while you're doing that, there's 10,000 bees there um, hanging on that can, trying to eat, and, uh, and you're messing with them. So um, just be aware of that. So you'll get it started here like this. And then as you lift up the can out of the, um, out of the package, the bees are going to, you know, fuel will crawl out through that gap and so on, and you'll get them there. But 
you really don't want to take the bees out of the package at this point. Um, so you want to take this packet, this can, and probably kind of scrape those bees off and just kind of let them stay in there because you're really headed for that queen cage. So this one is attached. It just has a little aluminum strip. Um, you can see that there and it's just bent and it's in a slot in the top of the package. So you get that out and then I put the, put the can back in so that the, the rest of the colony is there. Now, if the weather's bad, I really gotta keep this warm. Um, you don't want the queen to get, get cold and, and kill her in the, in the process. But now you have the queen cage free and you can do what you need to do with that. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. I wanna talk now about getting us to that point in the process with the plastic package, the bee bus. So again, the, the bee bus is a plastic package. It has um, a cover here. It has um, get a little light behind it. You can see there's a feed can in there. And there's also a queen cage hanging there. You can kind of see it maybe right there. See it flopping around in there. Okay, so I, I guess I'll show you how I do this. Um, other people might do it differently, um, but it's a little bit, um, what you, what you don't want to do is drop the queen down into the bottom of the package. And so when I did that with the, uh, with the wooden package, I, uh, I was careful to hold on to it, you know, reach in there and take, the, take that. So um, anyway, I need to figure out where that queen is. But when you, when you get this package, ideally, you're going to see this big triangular prism of bees in there just completely covering all of that. And so you need to figure out where that queen is. So we do that by looking underneath this cover without actually opening it up and letting any bees out. Now, this cover has um, two tabs, two locking tabs on two of the four things. This is gonna slide off and then come off, has keyhole um, type slots in there. But one of these is longer than the other. So you find the long one and I pry it up just a little bit. And then I slide the slide this over, and then I go over and I get the other one, pry it up, and then I slide this over. Now, of course, you're going to be have this sitting down, not holding up to a camera when you're doing it. I hope. Um, but then it comes off, and you see those keyhole slots. Um, that's uh, so that's that. So the the cover's off now. Set that aside. Now I have the, the feed can here, but right here I see this little pink tab. And normally that would be a, a pink hanger. And it's actually the hanger that the, um, that the queen came from. So let me grab one, just to kind of show you what you're, what you're looking at. So right here we have this little T head, this little nail head. That's what's sticking through above that slot. This little thing is in the slot. And then this cap is what the queen cage is attached to. So when I, when I, once I do this, now I can start looking at how I'm gonna get the queen out before I get the bees out. Because I don't really wanna take the can out and then try to dump the whole thing in there and make a mess. But with these, I don't pull the can out of the package um, to get the queen. What I do instead is I open up the end of the, the bee bus. So the, the latches on the end of this are um, like this right here. And there's just a, a method to the madness here. Um, I take the sharp edge of my hive tool. Um, Dave said, you know, you really ought to have a hive tool. Um, I agree because that's the only thing that really works well for this that I've found. So just go in underneath the the tooth on that, pry that little thing out. And then with my other hand, I'm gonna push up and open the door, okay? So while I'm doing this, trying not to shake it up too much, hopefully those bees are pretty well clustered. Um, Dave also mentioned having a spray bottle. So before you do this, you can have some one-to-one -one sugar water or even lighter than that. Just something, it just spritz the, um, the package 
um, so that they have something to keep them busy. Um, it's also a good idea to have something like this for when you're transporting the package from the vendor, whoever you have your bees from or have ordered them from. Because um, especially if you're going a long ways, you don't want them to dehydrate or um, overheat. So um, good idea to have that just for, for probably just water is what you'd have for the transport. But here you'd want sugar water to spray that. And it will gum up your sprayer and you'll have to deal with that. So now I have my door open and I'm gonna open the, the door up. And this, remember this is gonna be just totally covered with bees, but I could tell from looking up here where that pink thing was. So I could reach in there and pull this queen cage off. So take this out. The queen cage here has a candy plug in this tube right here, okay? So ideally, there, she should not be able to escape when I pull it off of that cap. So the cap that I had, um, got another one here. This is how it was attached in there. The on, oops, pushes on there. And so you're just twisting it a little bit and pulling it off. 